not quite as mobile as it once was. There was a time I could have made it up there in one step. That uh, takes me four or five. That's just a sign that I'm getting old. It's nice to be back with you again. Um, it has been a long time. I think the last time I was here was before COVID struck. So it was, and a lot has changed. As uh, I'm sure you all know, I lost my dad. Uh, it's coming two years ago this July. And it was funny because he died on the 13th of July, 2020. And my brother rang me and the first thing he said was, that's typical of my dad. He says, he dies the day the bonds are going out. You know, because my dad every year led the orange procession to the field with the Christian witness and preached the gospel at the field. But the Lord saw fit to take him home and he died peacefully in his sleep. And he's now in glory. And I know for a fact that there's no way on this earth that he would ever want to come back again. And I was glad that our brother mentioned about praying for family. We all do have loved ones that are not saved. We have loved ones who are backslidden. And we need to bring them before the Lord. Because the one thing I learned from my dad was this. He says, son, prayer changes things. Nothing else. Just prayer. If you have a Bible, would you open them up, please, to uh, the book of Isaiah? Isaiah chapter 7, and we're going to read the first 16 verses. Isaiah chapter 7, commencing to read at verse 1. And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went upward toward Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. And it was told the house of David, saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim, and his heart was moved. And the heart of his people, as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. Then saith the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thy and Shear, Ishub, thy son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. And say unto him, Take heed and be quiet. Fear not, neither be faint-hearted for the two tails of these smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of Razan with Syria and the son of Ramaliah. Because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Ramaliah have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, Let us go up against Judah and fax it. And let us make a breach therein for us, and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tobiel. Thus saith the Lord God, It shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin, and within three score and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it be not a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Ramaliah, Ramaliah's son. If ye will not believe, surely ye shall not be established. Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in thy depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, it is a small thing for you to weary men, but will ye weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. 
butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thy abhorrest shall be taken of both her kings. Ending at verse 16. Let's just still our hearts. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you this evening that we have this privilege of coming before you. We do pray, Lord, that you will bless this public reading of your word this evening. We thank you for every head that's bowed and for each home that's represented. And we pray indeed that the message tonight will be a message, perhaps not for all of them, but at least for one. That it may be a word of encouragement, might be a word of chastisement, but above all, Lord, it would be a word from you. So bless us, we pray. Amen. Amen. It has been troubling me over these last few months, and particularly over the last week, of how people in this land have turned their back upon God. We have people sitting in our government who would quite willingly kill a baby up until birth. They have no shame. Some of these so-called men profess to be Christians. Some are elders in churches. But when you put the question to them, they refuse to give you an answer. And it seems that no matter where the Christian goes, he's being attacked. No one wants to hear the word of God. And as it was with Ahaz, he was being attacked on multiple sides. So we as believers are being attacked today on multiple sides. So what should we do? The Bible makes it very clear that the one thing we should not do in these circumstances is to listen to our hearts. We shouldn't listen to our hearts. Verse 2 says this. And it was told the house of David saying Syria is confederate with Ephraim and his heart was moved and the heart of his people as the trees of the the, as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind do you know what Jeremiah said Jeremiah said this the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? God knows it. Because God says this, I the Lord search the heart, I try the reins or test the conscience. So God knows everything. We are told when trouble comes, when we get anxious or concerned, we should do this. Verse 4. Take heed and be quiet. Take heed and be quiet.
My children tell me that I should read this more often because the one thing that I can't be is quiet. Because I'm always talking. My problem is I'm always very nervous when I start. But once I get into my flow, sometimes my wife tells me that I forget to stop. So I can assure you it's 25 past 8. I'm just checking that clock because it's different to that one. I thought I had about five hours there, but I don't. But I can assure you, you will be out before 9 o'clock this evening. Bible says this. Take heed to the word of God. Psalm 119 and verse 9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. So we should take heed to God's word. When we take heed to God's word and obey it, we keep ourselves safe. But most of all, we keep ourselves pure and holy. We are urged to keep the word. Verse 11 of Psalm 119. Thy word have I hidden. We are told to practice it. Because if we hide the word of God within ourselves, then we will not sin against God. An old brother many years ago gave me these words of wisdom. He says, son, whatever you put in, he says, will eventually have to come out. And he says, if you fill your body with malice and anger, he said, that will come out. And he said, what sort of a witness is that to the Lord Jesus Christ? He says, rather fill your heart and your insides with love, with pure thoughts. And then when the time is right and someone needs that little word of encouragement, you can encourage them. So we're to keep the word, we're to practice the word. We're to bless God and ask him for more. I have listened to Christians over the years. And they're almost ashamed to get down on their knees to ask God to give them a little bit more. Well, one man said to me many years ago, he says, every day I get down on my knees and I ask God for something and every time God gives it to me. He says, I'm almost embarrassed to ask him again. And I said, why? Why? It's a never-ending well of goodness. You cannot drain God of everything. It's a continuous supply. Never be afraid to ask for more. Communicate knowledge to others. My old pastor was telling me today, was chatting to him, he says, do you know what he said? Some of the thickest people that I have ever met, he says, and I'm trying to say this as nicely as I can, he says, but some of the thickest people I have ever met are coming down with degrees. They have got degrees in this and degrees in that and and I have a master's in this and a PhD in that. He says, 
But if you try to hold a conversation with them, they can't speak. They can't sp- They're lost. So all the knowledge in the world doesn't make you a smart person. But having Jesus Christ in your heart does. Because when we don't know what to say, God will put the words into our mouths and help us. Let the word of God affect your own heart. Verse 14 of Psalm 119 says this, I have rejoiced. I have rejoiced. Verse 15 urges us to meditate on the word. But we can only do all of this if we take heed. Take heed. Take heed to the Holy Spirit. Hosea 4 and verse 10. For they shall eat and not have enough. They shall commit whoredom and shall not increase because they have left off to take heed to the Lord. This is a people who had sinned against God. A people who have neglected God neglected the truth they showed no mercy and of no knowledge of God and God said this was the case throughout all the land does it sound familiar when we look around us and see the land that we're living in People don't want to know the truth. Because if you tell people the truth, then they're only going to have to think. And it might stir their conscience. And they might have to reconsider the lifestyles that they're living, so they don't want to know the truth. Hosea says this in verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee that thou shalt be no priest to me seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children. And they were increased, so they sinned against me. Therefore, I will change their glory into shame. They shall eat up the sin of my people, and they shall set their heart on their iniquity. And there shall be like people, like priests, and I will punish them for their ways and reward them their doings. We have ministers and people in our pulpits who refuse to tell their congregations the truth. The one thing that I have always dreaded is standing before God and God saying to me, you never told that person that he needed to be saved. This people, this land, had turned their back on God. Just like this land here of ours today. But there is still hope. There is still hope for these people if we go and tell them 
we are urged to take heed of the Holy Spirit. If we don't listen to the Holy Spirit, there is no hope for the land. Take heed to the preacher. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 9. Here is a book written by a man full of wisdom. A man who was given a gift from God. A man who was asked by God, what is the greatest thing that you desire? Ask for anything and I will give it to you. First Kings chapter 3 and verse 5. And Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night and said, Ask what I shall give thee. Solomon said, Thou hast showed thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness, and in uprightness and uprightness in heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness, that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or to come in. Such a change from little children today. You ask them to do something and they just turn around and tell you no. I have friends who are school teachers, been school teachers for over 20 years and they say that school life is totally different. When they started, children obeyed them. Nowadays they just talk back and in some cases they get violent. These are children. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people which thou hast chosen. A great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart. To judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this, thy so great a people? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. If you and I were given the same choice, I wonder what we would ask for. Would we ask for an understanding heart, for wisdom? I can think of a whole lot of things that I would love to ask God for. But the things that I would ask for are only profitable for this life and not for the life to come. And there is much that we can learn from Solomon. And there is much that we can learn from the preachers and their preaching. But it doesn't take away from the fact that we have to read God's word in order to gain the knowledge that is required. I'm not a great reader of books. My wife can go through 
two or three books in the space of a week. Which becomes very annoying at times because she's always telling me that she's nothing to read. But no longer is it the case that I'm getting a delivery of new books every week to the house. She now just downloads them onto her iPad or whatever it is and reads away. But knowledge is good. It's good to have knowledge. But as someone once said, a little knowledge can be dangerous. But when we gain knowledge about God's word, it is no longer dangerous because it's good for us. Because we can see then how God operates. We can see what Jesus Christ desires for us. And Solomon could have asked for anything, but he chose wisdom. And such was the wisdom that God gave Solomon that people came from far and near. From all over the known world they came to see and to hear the wisdom of Solomon. But it wasn't Solomon's wisdom, it was God's wisdom imparted to him. Take heed to what the preacher tells you. Because the preacher's not preaching his words, he's preaching the words that God has given him. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13 Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Take heed to the brethren. There are two ways in which we can take this. Firstly, we should listen to what the brethren instruct us to do because it's good to take wise counsel. And you have good men in this hall, wise men, spiritual men. And I'm sure that if you ever had a problem, you could go to them. And they would instruct you in what to do. Or as it says in 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians 8 and verse 9. Take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to they that are weak. We should always be cautious of the weaker brother. As some of you know, um, I'm, I'm an alcoholic. It's hard to imagine seeing me standing here tonight. But if you'd have seen me many years ago, you would never have believed that this is the same person. And a brother said to me one time, he says, Jimmy, I know you don't drink because you're a drunk and he said it he wasn't being nasty about it and I had to correct him I says no I says that's wrong I says I don't drink because I'm a drunk he says I don't drink because I'm a Christian and God has changed my lifestyle that's why I don't drink 
Because the last thing that I would want to do would be a stumbling block to a weaker brother. I often thought, what would people think of me if they seen me walking into a pub and coming out two hours later, falling all over the place? And then they saw me two nights later standing in a pulpit and preaching. Boys out there, they wouldn't have a very high opinion of me, would they? So we need to be careful about our actions, about the things that we say. Have you ever considered the consequences of your words or your walk? Do we guard our tongues? They say this is the smallest member of the body. And yet this little tongue has caused so much division and hurt in churches. Because people say things. And sometimes as soon as the words are out of your mouth, you turn around and say to yourself, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have said that. Do you know what? It's too late. Can't take it back. Once you've spoken those harmful words, they cannot be taken back. And God warns us, take heed. Take heed. Bible says the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. In verse 10 of James 3, we read these words, Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be. We need to take heed, dear friends. We need to get ourselves deep into this old book. Decisions have consequences. Every decision you make comes with consequences. And they not only affect you, but they affect your family and those round about. It goes for what you say and it goes for where you walk. Our walk should be holy and beyond reproach. In the book of Ephesians, we read these words. Chapter 4 and verse 24. And that ye put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. When we get saved, we put on the new man. God is living within us. The Holy Spirit lives within us. And yet we say and do and go to places that we shouldn't go to. We say things we shouldn't say. Ephesians 5 and 2. Ephesians 5 and 1. But be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. And walk in love. As Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savour.
Is our walk right? Is our talk right? Genesis 5 and 24 says that Enoch, Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. What a testimony. What a testimony. Enoch's walk and talk with God was so great that God didn't allow him to die, that he took him into glory with him. Is that our walk? We should try to walk like that. Take heed to yourself. We have been told to feed the flock which Christ has bought with his own blood. Why should we take heed? Well, Timothy says we should take heed because some shall depart from the faith. And we're living in those days those final days I do believe that God will return and return very soon but there are many today who once walked with God and they're now far away some who have completely turned their back upon God and disowned him uh, many of you will know John Piper. John Piper's son turned around and told his father that God no longer exists as far as he's concerned. That all those years that I listened to you preaching, Father, you were preaching nonsense. Because God's dead. God does not exist. And his son now tours America, going round universities telling young people that God is just a myth. Just a myth. Far easier the judgment in Sodom and Gomorrah than it will be for that young man when he stands before God. Because he knew the truth. He knew the truth and he has turned his back upon it. We need to be there to encourage. Encourage one another. Be there for one another. Sometimes all a brother and sister wants is for someone to put an arm around their shoulder and ask them how they're doing. I had a brother one morning in church ask me, how are you doing today, Jim? I says, well, if you've got two hours after the service, I says, I'll be only too glad to tell you. And I've never seen a man run as quick in all my life. You see, he was only asking because he felt he had to ask. He wasn't really concerned. But people will know when you're concerned. They will know when you're genuine. And sometimes that's all it takes. It's just a gentle arm around the shoulder and say, How are you? What do you want me to pray for? We are building... A church, God's church, Christ's church, through his strength. And our foundation is Jesus Christ himself. Are you taking heed to these things? Paul said this in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 11. 
study to be quiet. Study to be quiet. Or as the psalmist said, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Dear friends, let us take heed this evening. Take heed to the word of God. Take heed to everything that he wants to tell us. But he can only tell us if we read this book. We talk to God through prayer. God talks to us through his word. And God answers prayer. Because none of us would be here tonight without someone praying for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you this evening that we have this privilege, this privilege of knowing Jesus Christ as our Saviour. We pray, Lord, that we may take heed to your word, to what it contains. Let us take heed to everything that you've told us. And we pray, Lord, that as we leave this place, we may leave it with a more determined desire within our hearts to tell others, to tell others about you. We ask for your blessing upon this hall and for those who lead the work here. Bless them and encourage them and give them souls for their labor. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.